Well, welcome to CCC's first podcast. This is Pastor Dina and Pastor Mitch here with me. The, <laughs> the princess, oh me, the princess diva and the dean, we're all here for a deeper dive. No, this is something that Pastor Dina has had on her heart for a long time doing a podcast. You've had this yeah. for months, so At now least. we're actually able to do it. Thanks to Don and all of his equipment. We've got all this stuff set up. Yeah. So the uh, ideas are we're going to have more pack podcasts down the road, different subjects. But right now, this is our deeper dive. And we're just going to go deeper into the book of Luke. As you know now, we are on this journey with Jesus going through the gospel of Luke. And this past Sunday, Pastor Mitch preached on Luke chapters 1 through 3. And obviously, there's a lot more information than what you can relate on a Sunday morning. So we wanted to take it, uh, just time to go a little deeper. That's why we call it Deeper Dive. And just talk about some of the other things that are going on in the book of Luke in the chapters that we're reading. So you will be seeing a podcast every week, um, sometime midweek, and we'll just be going through those chapters. So starting with the beginning. What about Luke? Well, you, you mentioned this, but, you know, Luke is such an interesting guy because he's not really Jewish. He's called the beloved physician. Mm -hmm. uh, and then he's, he's obviously a man of high intelligence. He's a man who, when he wrote his account, was writing to an audience that was wider than just the Jewish audi audience. Yeah. He was speaking to the world. So he, he introduces Jesus, the genealogy he goes through. He goes all the way back to Adam. He doesn't just stop at Abraham like Matthew does. So the two genealogies of people say, you know, the two genealogies that are listed are different. They are because one is the genealogy of Joseph. The other is the genealogy of Mary. So that's why you have two different genealogies. And but, Luke has which one? And Luke does the one. He's with Mary. He goes all the way back through uh, Adam. Yeah. I mean, he goes all the way back to the very beginning to show that Jesus is the savior of the world and not just the Jewish Messiah. Yeah. And that's one of the reasons we chose this gospel, because obviously leading up to Easter, we could have gone through the narrative and studied the life of Jesus with Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. But I personally love Luke being a physician. He records the most healings uh, that Jesus, uh, in Jesus' ministry yeah. um, of any of the gospels. So I just, I love hearing about that, seeing the miraculous, not just in the healings, but other things that he talks about. Yeah. And I think yeah. you were reading in your study guide um, about Luke that there was something else in this book. Yeah, Luke, it's just amazing that Luke records more instances of joy than the other Gospels, Matthew or Mark. He talks all about joy, and, you know, and there is such a joy as we know in serving Jesus. Yes. Giving your life to him, seeing him answer prayers where you see you know, people love the miraculous, but I believe the Lord is also teaching us how to walk in divine health. And that's another topic. But to walk in the miracles, uh, you can't really, quote, control it. It just happens. Mm -hmm. But to walk in divine health is a lifestyle choice. It is a point of where that you're allowing the Holy Spirit to guide you, lead you, direct you, your speech, your what you think. All this sort of stuff goes in together to make your life a, a healthy lifestyle. It's not just miraculous. It's where you walk in divine healing. You walk in the divine presence. You walk in his divine life. Yes. And speaking of that, the divine, we see a lot of that in the first couple chapters of Luke. Um, they talk beginning in chapter one, the birth of John the Baptist. And there's a miraculous encounter with Zechariah that he had Go ahead. I know, I know, I know you're supposed to ask all the questions, but my question <laughs> to you would be, why is the story of John the Baptist so important in these early chapters? Because it's part of the prophetic journey, the prophetic words that were given in the Old Testament that are being fulfilled in the New Testament. Yeah, I think it's, to me, it's interesting that, that for Jesus to come, he didn't just come unannounced. He had to have a messenger go before him, which is what you're saying. It fulfills prophecy. So when you read through the book of Luke, just remember no, no scriptures of a personal private interpretation. So you can find just about everything in the book of Luke 
is being prophesied about in other portions of the Old Testament. So that's what makes studying the Bible so much fun because it's like a little clue. You can be like a detective. You can go, to go back into scriptures and find out, well, now, why is John the Baptist here? Oh, I see. Well, there was all these different links like in Isaiah and other prophets or uh, Malachi 400 years before that talked about a messenger would go before the Lord. Yes. So that's why I think there's such a prominent, in these early chapters, a prominent uh, portion given to the birth of John the Baptist. Yeah. So you wanted to talk a little bit more about not only the birth of John the Baptist, but the birth of Jesus. Yeah. There's, I think there's several things here. Was it, you have to realize the Bible is a spiritual book. In other words, the Bible was not written to make sense to your mind. The Bible was not recorded so you could just say, oh, yeah, 2 plus 2 equals 4. In the Bible, 2 plus 2 could equal 22,000. 2 plus 2 could be 2 million. I mean, it's just unbelievable how the Bible exponentially goes way beyond what we could ask or think. It's just it's, it's the, the Bible itself is such a fascinating document of God recording his thoughts through people to speak to us, and it's still here today. So when you read the Scriptures, you have to keep it in mind. It's not written so much for your mind. It's written for your heart. It's written for the spirit. Mm -hmm. And so what did your spirit get out of Luke? <laughs> One and two. <laughs> There's, when, you, when you read the story of John the Baptist and Jesus, here's what's fascinating. Supernaturally, angels came, spoke to him. We talk about this stuff, angelic visitations. Obviously, the Bible says do not worship angels. But the Bible goes on to talk about that angels are messengers. They come from the throne of God. I think God sends messenger angels to overcome sometimes our doubt or our fears, or maybe we've got blockages that we just can't let the Holy Spirit lead us and guide us. So God sends mm -hmm. messenger angels to overcome those barriers that are in people's lives. So with Elizabeth, she knew she wasn't getting pregnant. Her husband, Zachariah, knew that they weren't going to happen. You have Mary that just obviously out of the blue, just the angel shows up in her life. And I'm putting this in a polite way. Her life was ruined. Yeah. I mean, until Jesus announced he was the Messiah for 30 mm -hmm. years, Mary walked with that shame or yeah. that, uh, that uh, I don't know how to describe it, not well, embarrassment. She, but she could have actually been stoned in yeah. that culture yeah. uh, for being pregnant out of wedlock. Yeah. It says Joseph considered leaving her, and he decided not to. Then he mm -hmm. was warned in a dream. God said, this is of me. And so they went and got married. And what's always amazing to me is that we know from scriptures that they had at least seven more children, at least seven more, because it talks about all of his brothers. It, it names five different brothers that were with Jesus. And it says sisters, plural. So there's mm -hmm. at least two. So they had at least seven more children uh, after Jesus. So God rewarded Mary for her obedience and gave her a quiver full of kids. So I just think it's just interesting how God always says that when you serve me, I, God, give you back more than what you could ever give me. Yeah. And speaking of Mary, I just have to go back to that. You did talk about this on Sunday, but in Luke 1, uh, verse 37, and this is after the angel appeared to Mary saying, you're going to conceive a child. And at that time, obviously, she was not married. She was betrothed to Joseph. And she asked, how, since I'm a virgin, how can I conceive a child? And so the angel told her, the Holy Spirit will overshadow you. And you will conceive a son who will be the son of God. Then Mary's response is, for nothing is impossible with God. Mary knows that. But I, I had to, because I heard this teaching um, another time and they said those words in verse 37 where it says for nothing is impossible with God also mean for no word spoken by God is without power I love that 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 there is power in the words God gives us which is why our words are so important because when God speaks something that word has the power in it to accomplish what he's speaking and I think that goes in with the point you made about Zechariah when the angel appeared to him and said, you and your wife are going to have a son, even though your wife's been barren, you're old, you know, and Zechariah kind of said, well, I don't see this happening. And the angel said, you're going to be mute. He shut his mouth <laughs> for the rest of the time while Elizabeth was pregnant because our words 
can either confirm and line up, we can declare the promises of God, or our words can negate them. And so our words are very, very powerful. Very good. Yeah, Isaiah talks about too, no word from God is void of power or returns empty. It always mm-hmm. accomplishes its purpose. But uh, there's so many things in this in this this narrative of Luke and the story that, you know, for 400 years has been total silence on the spiritual end. And all mm-hmm. of a sudden, all this activity starts happening with Zachariah's wife, Elizabeth, Mary, yeah. Joseph, this whole thing is going on. What's interesting to me, though, is that when the word of God came to them about the destinies of their children, is that it's not fulfilled till decades later. Yeah. Like when they when God spoke to them about their children, it was decades later that it actually came to pass. And I think mm-hmm. there's something about perseverance yeah. that God wants to develop in all of us. I, for one, not very persevering. It's like I'm ready to get stuff done. <laughs> but I believe the Lord is after, it says in Hebrews, that it's through faith and patience. Uh-oh, you that used that you, other P word. That, yeah, that you inherit <laughs> the promises. There's another promises. So every promise from God that he makes to us, we know is not void of power, another P word, but it's like it's through faith and patience. And sometimes when you read the scriptures, it's like you read one verse and the next verse could be years between mm-hmm. the two verses. And you just think it just happened like the next day. And yeah, that's I not just the flipped way the page. Went. Yeah, just that's... there it is. It's right. <laughs> and this is the, the obviously the beloved physician, Luke, writing an account to put it in, in a proper order, the narrative, so we can follow along. One of the things I also want to point out to about John the Baptist is that his whole purpose, is said, was to prepare the way of the Lord. Yeah. So how do you prepare the way of the Lord? I mean, I started thinking about that. What what was it about John's message that prepared the way of the Lord? Well, we know that to come into God's presence, you can't be conscious of sin. And the only way you receive forgiveness of sins is through a blood sacrifice if you lived in Israel in those days. Hmm. However, after the cross and Jesus rose from the dead, now it's the blood of Jesus that brings cleansing. But you cannot come into God's presence with a conscious knowledge of sin. So John had to prepare the people to say, if you want to be in God's presence, if you want to experience God, you've got to prepare the way. You've got to prepare your hearts. And so he spoke Mm -hmm. to them about repentance. He talked to them about getting their lives right, getting all in, going for God. And so Mm -hmm. it says that they were by the hundreds or thousands of people gathered to go get baptized uh, Mm -hmm. at the Jordan River and that John was preaching. And John was not a very uh, chiffon, silk-looking, you know, preacher. I mean, the Bible... He didn't have a suit and tie. Exactly. He wasn't... He wasn't... I mean, he was a prosperity preacher, but he didn't look it. I'll put it that way. But he did wear a camel's hair coat, so that's pretty good. (laughs) And then he wore, you know, it says he used to eat uh, locust with honey. That was his meal. Uh, I I think I would have starved. The guy was obviously... The guy was obviously a rough guy, but is what God used to prepare the way to announce the ministry of Jesus. And I just think God, if God could use John the Baptist and I'm not denigrating him, God can use you and I, I mean, he can use us to do great things. So I just want just to encourage you that we want to prepare the way of the Lord. There's another thought in this. If we're preparing the way of the Lord, sometimes God uses you to plant seeds in people's lives that will be harvested later. Sometimes it's just you just speaking a word of kindness. Sometimes it's you just acting in obedience to pray for someone like, like we did the other day. We prayed for the lady that had that physical condition. She'd recover from COVID, went completely well. And you can tell the story, but the Lord put on your heart to pray for her. Well, yeah, uh, she came in. It's the lady that stops by our church, does um, just some business things. And she had come in and I asked how she was doing, knowing she had had COVID. um, I think it was back sometime early December. Mm -hmm. She recovered fine as far as she wasn't really that sick during it, so she went through it okay, but she just had some lingering um, congestion, and she said she just felt tired all the time, and so uh, we just prayed for her. We said, can we, can we pray for you? Because we know God's power. He has healing power for each one of us, and just as we're reading, we're reading these Gospels, but it's not just history. It is active now. This is what Jesus is about. And so he wants to work through and with each one of us. 
And so we prayed, and she said, even as we were done praying, she felt better already. So we just give all the glory and praise to God for that. But that, but that's an example of planting seed, which is what we see John the Baptist did. He was planting seed. He was plowing. Mm -hmm. He was going through, the, if you would, the civilization or the society of Israel. He was speaking the word of the Lord. They're getting right with God. They're ready. They're anticipating what? The arrival of the Messiah. And that's the joy that we have is we're awaiting his arrival. We're awaiting his presence. And when Jesus comes into your life, there's no mistake. When Jesus comes into your conscience and he fills your heart with his spirit, there is nothing else like it. The, fl the cleansing, the forgiveness, the freedom, yes. the joy that you have, the joy unspeakable that Jesus has, has saved me. He's called me. Mm -hmm. Just the realization that this is not just a intellectual exercise. It's something has really transformed in you, yes. that the Spirit of God has come to take up residence in you. That's mm -hmm. to me, is incredible. It is. And I want to continue on that in a second. But when you were talking about John the Baptist and his message was one of repentance, his words were not always, <clears throat> shall we say, flavored with honey. Um, in fact, and I just wonder what you say to this uh, in chapter 3, verse 7. So John said to the crowds coming out to be baptized by him, You brood of vipers, <laughs> who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? So um, what are your thoughts about that? He was speaking to politicians. <laughs> We'll just go on from Forget there. Forget I ask. He, he was he was speaking to the local government officials, state, federal. He was speaking to all of them. We all know that. There's no there's no doubt whether they were whether they were religious or civil. It doesn't matter. They were all the same boat. <laughs> okay. Next point. <laughs> um, but I think just to realize, I think some people think that all the words are just. Uh, these kind, you know, soft words to draw people. And, and God does uh, bring us to salvation through his kindness. But there are things, too, that, you know, we have to be dealing with in our lives, which is part of the repentance. Well, saying that, I'll just add to your, to your thought, is that the book of Jude tells us that sometimes people get saved by snatching them by their hair and pulling them from the fire. Yeah. And I know that that's got to be a very dramatic graphic uh, mm -hmm. circumstance to, but sometimes when I used to do street preaching, you know, people say, why are you yelling? Mm -hmm. I'd say, well, you're so deaf in your sins. You can't hear. You have to talk <laughs> loud, but no, it's not so much yelling at people, but sometimes yeah. it's like, if you knew someone was about to go across a bridge and the bridge was out, you would do everything in your power to scream, yell, wave, stop, don't go anymore. The bridge is out. If you continue on, you're going to plunge into the gorge below the bridge. You just mm -hmm. don't want to do that. And we see people do this all the time with destructive choices, lifestyle choices they make mm -hmm. that bring destruction and misery into their lives. So yeah. we as a church, sometimes you got to jump up and down and wave and, hey, stop. It's not that we're judging them. We're trying to prevent them. Uh, mm -hmm. from going to further down that road that's out or the bridge that's out that will cause them misery and destruction in their lives. Yeah. Well, and just the other thing, I think he was uh, also speaking to some of the Pharisees. So that would be some of the religious leaders that were there because we can get so caught up in what we're doing in our traditions that we miss the reason, the, yeah. the purpose. Well, John didn't go to their school. <laughs> he wasn't in he wasn't in their seminary school he was trained out you know in the streets if you would and he was uh he was uh not recognized as having been properly trained yeah but he's the vessel that god used so i just want to just encourage you if you're, if you're listening and watching just you know your educational background is important because it, a lot of times it brings self-confidence but a lot of times it's the education that separates us from the purposes of god or we miss uh, the things of God, because we're relying too much on our intellect mm -hmm. and not on the spirit. And they both yeah. have to work in harmony. It, yeah. it can't have one dominate the others. You know, you've been in ministry a long time. There are people that come in that, I mean, you wouldn't trust them as far as you could throw them because they're always so spiritual. They're always got this new word from God. Mm -hmm. Then there's other people that are so intellectual and they're so dry that there's no life in it. There's no water. There's no uh, living water flowing yeah. out. It's like it's just 
all intellectualism, and that doesn't work either. Well, and as we were talking, I guess it was last week, leading up to Sunday to talk about these chapters, you know, there was something that we kept going back to that we weren't able to talk about Sunday, wanted to go to, and it relates exactly to what you're saying, and it's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit makes a difference in our lives, and that was activated in John the Baptist's life at a very, very early age. In fact, as we see, not far uh, into conception. And, and this is one of the things we just wanted to um, bring up and focus in on was you can look back in Luke 1, um, chapter, well, actually yep. verse 41 and then 44. So this is with Elizabeth and verse 41 Mary went to see Elizabeth. Now, Elizabeth was the one who was um, pregnant with John the Baptist. Mary was also pregnant when she went to visit her. And it said, as uh, Mary came in to Elizabeth's home, it said, when Ms. Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And then on as you're reading, it's like she says, my child leaped in my womb was also filled at that time. And so we see that. Then we also see it with Zechariah. And I know you wanted to speak a little bit to this, but Zechariah was muted. He wasn't able to talk until John the Baptist was born and he wrote down his name is John and fulfilling what the angel had told him. And then it says his tongue was loosed. And if you look in verse 67, this is in Luke 1, it says his father Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied. So there was an instant response as he was filled with the Holy Spirit, then he moved into this prophetic utterance. That's good. So I don't know if you have anything with that because then we'll go on because there was somebody else who was filled with the Holy Spirit in these early chapters. And we're moving there. It's talking about the baptism of Jesus. And I wanted to take a few minutes just to focus in on this. Now we're skipping ahead to Luke chapter 3. When Jesus comes to John and he says, I want to be water baptized. Now tell me, why would Jesus need to be water baptized? Says John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. Well, what did Jesus have to repent of? Wow, that's a deep question. <laughs> we need to refer to our concordances and uh, go through our systematic theology. Because the Bible is very clear that Jesus lived a sinless life. Yes. It's very clear that Jesus never sinned, that Jesus never spoke, thought, acted in a way that was contrary to the will of the Heavenly Father. Mm-hmm. So that question, why was Jesus water baptized if John preached a baptism of repentance? You can see in some of the exchanges where John looks at Jesus and he said, you're asking me, John, to baptize you, Jesus. Yeah. And I'm the one that really needs to be baptized by you. Yes. But Jesus said it was to prepare or fulfill all righteousness. So Jesus was very conscious, in my in my opinion, mm-hmm. of fulfilling prophecy. Yeah. And that he had to walk out the demands that were placed upon him as the mm-hmm. Messiah. There were certain prophetic words that had been spoken. And this was one of the things that he was telling John that it was part of, uh, in my opinion, his modeling for us yes. what it meant to be a son of God and to walk in obedience to the Father. Yeah. And, you know, I wanted to press into this because this was something that I, a few years ago, was able to teach on uh, to a group of pastors in Madagascar. And you I brought a riot. I did. I did. They, the, uh, pastors that attended the meeting that the host pastor had um they ended up locking him in the church and you had what 800 pastors there uh well that's a little evangelistic anointing but (laughs) there were 700 by the last day that came out uh to the church but a lot of the leaders and deacons and some of them traveled hundreds of miles whether it was on foot or by bicycles Mm -hmm. to get there i mean that's their mode of transportation But we talk about this in our foundation class, but you also see it in the life of Jesus. Jesus was dedicated by his parents. Yeah. Correct? And so 
you know, and we talked about that on Sunday, Simeon, Simeon and Anna had actually been waiting at the temple um, because they were promised that they were going to see the long-awaited Messiah before they died. And so this is in Luke chapter 2, where you can just read about Mary and Joseph bringing Jesus to the temple to be dedicated. Well, in um, some denominations, a lot, in fact, the one I was speaking to was a Lutheran denomination, Reformed Lutheran over there, um, they dedicated and also called it baptism, baptized children when they were born and you can see this in the life of Jesus that his parents dedicated him shortly after his birth but then he was water baptized um, in chapter 3 which was really 30 years later it started his ministry so there is a difference between dedication and water baptism Mm -hmm. And so that was some of what I talked about over there. And if you want to just speak to it, um, you want me to keep talking? No, you're good. All right, I got it. You ought to tell the story. Yeah, so because when you dedicate a child, obviously a baby, they're not old enough to make their own decisions. So this is the parent's faith saying, I want to dedicate my child. I want to raise them to know Jesus, which is wonderful. It's a great thing. But you see with Jesus taking that step to get water baptized, even though he himself did not need it, he was modeling it for us to say, if you follow after me, then you do what I'm doing. And he got water baptized because it was his own faith. And Mm -hmm. so for us, when we preach and teach about water baptism, it is our faith saying that we are declaring that Jesus is Lord of our lives. In fact, we're having water baptisms, um, Uh, Palm Sunday. So the end of March, we're going to be having water baptisms. In fact, we just had a young man that came in the church yesterday uh, and he said, I want to get water baptized. I need to. So we're just seeing this move of God that continues. But there is a difference between dedication, which is the parents faith, and then your own faith when you mature and you declare Jesus as your Lord and Savior to get water baptized. And and that was the issue that caused the riot over there because a lot of these pastors had been serving and they have never gotten water baptized. They were dedicated when they were babies. And they said, you mean we have to go get water baptized af- after we've been preaching? And yeah, it's it's a humility thing, but it's also just a declaration of following God. It mm-hmm. is that public declaration mm-hmm. that I am a follower of God. In fact, Christopher Alam had shared with us different times how in the Muslim faith, and he speaks and preaches to a lot of Muslims, sees mm-hmm. them get saved, that if you, they wait, if, if a person, if a Muslim declares themselves a Christian and said, I follow after Jesus, Jesus is my Lord, They won't necessarily get killed at that moment. But if that person then goes and gets water baptized, they know that they are serious about following after Jesus, and it will often cost them their life. So Mm -hmm. even Muslims know the difference Mm -hmm. between, you know, just... Well, they said that about Hindu families also in India, that if a person follows Jesus, 330 million gods and goddesses, it's okay. Mm -hmm. But the minute their son or daughter decides to go into waters of baptism, then the family disowns them. It's like that literal relationship dies and that the family no longer acknowledges their son or daughter is alive. So yeah. it's a huge separation, yeah. which is the point of baptism. It's a separating out, as go. it tells us in Second Corinthians 6, come out and be separate. We're told in Romans 6, 1 through 7, all about water baptism. Mm-hmm. And the whole purpose is, is because... If you've really repented and you want to serve Jesus, you want to walk straight. Yes. You don't want to walk crooked. Like we talk about that road and San Francisco has all the little curves in it. <laughs> we the saw Bible that. says <laughs> make straight the paths of the Lord. Yes. And so that means that you want to walk straight. You want to walk on the straight and narrow. Mm-hmm. Well, you can't, in my opinion, without water baptism, mm-hmm. you will completely deviate and get knocked off course because water baptism was was given by God to us to help us as we walk with Jesus this side of heaven to walk the straight and narrow. You yes. overcome so much more when you bury that old sin-loving nature. Yes. That's the whole purpose of water baptism is mm-hmm. to get rid of the sin-loving nature. In Jesus, it was him modeling 
for mm-hmm. us that say that, yeah, as an adult, I need to be water baptized. We're saying that as a person of faith, whenever you come to faith in Christ, water baptism is your plea or your cry to God. It says in Peter for a clean conscience. It tells us that we join the body of Christ. It tells us that we bury the old man. It tells us we walk in resurrection life. We're told through the scriptures that when you're walking in uh, uh, through faith, that you're believing that God's going to just cut off your old sin-loving nature. It's just an amazing burial that's the happiest funeral you ever go to. Yeah, I was going to say, that's what you say a lot of times. Yeah. The first time I ever heard it was from you saying that, the happiest funeral you'll ever attend <laughs> when you see somebody get water baptized. So the point of walking with Jesus is to walk the straight and narrow, and so yes. you can be successful. It's not, and let, let me just go back to another thought, is that God created us in the Garden of Eden to walk with him. Mm-hmm. So you know how easy it is to sin. I'm just telling you right now, hey, guys, if you're watching, I can I can sin with two hands tied behind my back, bouncing in my chair. <laughs> I can sin and no problem. It just is natural. But when you follow Jesus and when you're walking with him, you were created for that purpose. You were created to do that. You were not created to follow sin. You were not created to be a slave to sin. You were created to be a son or daughter of God. So Amen. baptism helps you get back into those paths of peace so that you can walk out your purposes that God has for you. Yes. So if you are watching this and you, you know, are intrigued, you want to find out more, you're interested in water baptism, we have resources on our website, uh, discipleship materials. And in fact, there's a study specifically on water baptism. You can go through some of the uh, scriptures that relate to the things that Pastor Mitch is talking about as far as circumcision and it's a burial and all the things that God does when you partner with him in this. So I want to just hit two quick things regarding the baptism of Jesus before we end this, uh, getting ready then for Luke 4 through 6 the following week. But I'm just going to read this text. It's in Luke 3, starting in verse 21. And it says, when all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. And as he was praying, heaven was opened and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven. You are my son whom I love. With you, I am well pleased. I just, I love, I love the father's voice in this and what he says. And there's There's two things with that. Um, One is just the fact that Jesus hadn't performed any miracles yet at that time. He hadn't healed anyone. He hadn't raised anybody from the dead. He hadn't called his disciples. He hadn't done anything other than grow up. Um, He grew in wisdom and stature and favor with God and man. We can see that in in Luke chapter 2. He was obedient. He hadn't sinned. That was huge. But just the fact that the father said to him, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. And I believe that that's what God speaks over each one of us. You know, as we just say, God, we want to follow after you. We make Jesus our Lord and Savior. When you say that, when you receive that gift of eternal life through Jesus, then God looks at us through his son. And he says, this is my son. This is my daughter in whom I am well pleased. The other thing about that declaration, and I've heard this um, taught on, is those words with you I am well pleased, that in the culture at that time, that's what a father would say over his son. He would take him out into the marketplace in the village where they lived. And whenever his son was trained up in his um, what do you call it? occupation of the day. So uh, whether they were a carpenter, which that's what Jesus did growing mm-hmm. up, when the father felt like the son was trained enough to be able to take over that business or enter in and, and do the same work that he was doing, he would take his son out into the marketplace and he would declare, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. He mm-hmm. would say those words and that was a declaration to everyone around saying, okay, my son can do exactly what I've been doing. He is trained. He is ready to go. And so the father declaring this, besides the fact that you have a voice from heaven, I mean, that would be uh, life altering to begin with. But he was saying over the life of Jesus, this is my son. He's ready to go and do 
exactly what I've called him to do, to represent me. And I just think that's significant because this is the beginning of the ministry of Jesus. He's just turned 30, and this is the beginning. The other thing we see is the Holy Spirit descended on him. So this is the other person, as I was talking about earlier, being filled and baptized with the Holy Spirit, says the Holy Spirit descended on Jesus in bodily form like a dove. So when we see a dove, it represents Holy Spirit. It's not just a bird sitting on his shoulder (laughs) because some people talk about the Holy Spirit. Okay, there was a dove that came down. No, this is the Holy Spirit, the third part of the Trinity that came upon Jesus and said, okay, now you're ready for ministry. Well, it's interesting because I really appreciate what you just said about the Father and the Son taking over. There's also the other aspect that I just enjoyed. I've never seen this before to just recently, like in the last several weeks, in verse 20, uh, where is it at? In 21, mm-hmm. while he prayed. So Jesus was water baptized by his cousin, John the Baptist, comes up out of the water, the heavens open, you know, the spirit descends, the voice speaks, but it says Jesus was praying. Mm-hmm. So again, it's another example of how we're to be if we want to receive things from God is through prayer. And so he's receives. And it's always interesting to me that Jesus was fully God, but also fully man. Yes. So if Jesus needed the Holy Spirit, Jesus, the son of God, Jesus that never sinned, Jesus yeah. that never had any problem with sin nature, me full of sin, full of all kinds of issues. How much more do I need the Holy Spirit if Jesus needed the Holy Spirit? If Amen. Jesus needed the Holy Spirit, <laughs> I needed so much more. And so that's what this is all about. So I'm always amazed at how many people are so resistant to this thing we call the baptism in the Holy Spirit. It's just it's part of the it's part of the dynamic. It's it's part of the package you need while on earth to serve the Lord fully. I think without the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you miss the supernatural. You miss the miraculous. You miss the gifts of the Spirit. You miss the things mm-hmm. that God wants to employ his uh, followers with to help advance the kingdom of God, to destroy the works of hell, meet supernatural, 2 Corinthians 10, you have supernatural, powerful weapons God gives you that Mm -hmm. are always in the package of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, and we actually have a a study on that too with our discipleship studies on our website if you want to find out more about baptism of the Holy Spirit. I'm sure we're going to be talking again, about the ministry of the Holy Spirit through the life of Jesus in the coming weeks. But we're out of time. It goes fast when we're talking. I guess that's what you get when you get two pastors (laughs) talking. Come up for breath of air. (laughs) Quick, get my words in. So we're going to leave you with this, just that in Luke 3, Jesus was baptized by the Holy Spirit, and then He was led someplace by the Holy Spirit, and we'll pick that up in chapter four next week. So thank you so much for joining us. I don't know if you have any closing remarks, dare I ask. (laughs) I've always got closing (laughs) remarks, but no, I just want to uh, just encourage you. I thought you what you what you shared, your insights are really good. I learned some things even just sitting here as we're talking, and I hope it's a blessing to those that listen. Yeah. So until next week, we will see you then.